It's the Viking Age, and no land is safe from the brutality of the plundering Norsemen. As this fearsome warrior culture sets its sails toward the uncharted waters of the Western Hemisphere, a downpour of stone-tipped arrows awaits their arrival. The indigenous people that the Vikings would call Skraelings are armed and ready to defend their claim to all that lies beyond the shores. A bloody showdown between intrepid explorers and trained hunters is about to commence. As berserkers and bowmen square up for an intercontinental skirmish for the ages, we're here to determine, through an analysis of weapons and warfare, which side will prevail in an all-out fight for survival. Spears and harpoons will fly, longboats and canoes will ford through bloodied waters, the gates of Valhalla will be flung open wide for the first time in the New World. We begin this saga with a group of Norse voyagers who have recently created a settlement in Newfoundland. They're led by a man named Thorvald Eriksson. Seeking distant lands was in Thorvald's blood as his father was the famous explorer Eric the Red, and his brother Leif Erikson, the first man from Europe to set foot on continental America. Determined to live up to his family's prestigious past, Thorvald established a small colony that was meant to act as a base of operations for further exploration of the region. Thorvald's party quickly became aware that there were already people living in Newfoundland and that they were not strangers to warfare. The Beotuk people, relatives of the Algonquin, lived off the land and sea in relatively small communities. Because they inhabited the territory of the main islands, staple game like moose and rabbits were scarce, making the Beotuk a tough and adaptable people. Their penchant for whaling and building large structures for shared living was not unlike the Vikings themselves, and the Beotuk were equally shaped by their coastal lifestyle. The Beotuk traveled the local waters in canoes made of caribou or seal flesh reinforced wood often dressed in the fur of the caribou, and stored the meat from their kills in great houses over the winter. With the incursion of the Vikings imminent, it was a meeting of two cultures shaped by cold and harsh natural environments. After finding the camp of the small scouting party, the Vikings wound up with eight Beotuk captives, all of whom they killed in short order. That's the Vikings for you. What followed was a rude awakening as an entire warband descended upon the foreigners later that day shouting a battle cry as they fired their bows at Thorvald's ship for some time. From their position in the water, all the Vikings could do was raise their shields and hope to deflect the Beotuk's projectile hailstorm. By the time the Beotuk ceased their assault and retreated behind the tree line, the Vikings took at least one confirmed casualty, Thorvald Eriksson himself. The Viking leader took an arrow through his armpit and was fatally injured. He's quoted in the sagas as saying, here is the arrow, and this wound will cause my death. At least he was self-aware. Thorvald was laid to rest with standing crosses at his head and feet, and is remembered in myth as the first man from Europe to die in the Americas. The death of Thorvald was only the beginning, as this encounter would lay the groundwork for an adversarial relationship with the indigenous people that would endure for as long as the Vikings were in the Americas. While the Viking historical record of these ongoing ambushes is shrouded in folklore, we can infer how the technology used by both sides would have influenced the battle. On the Viking side, there is no understating the importance of iron in their weapons. The deep bogs of Denmark near the Viking homeland were chock full of accessible iron ore, which the Scandinavian tribes were able to smelt into a variety of tools. But plentiful resources didn't translate to unlimited iron, and the Vikings made the most of what they had by arming most of their warriors with axes and lances, both weapons that used metal for the striking surface but used wood for the hand and shaft. The Vikings did produce swords as well, but because they required more iron to forge, owning a blade was a privilege afforded by only a few great Vikings. In addition, because of the inconsistent quality of these iron weapons, those that were durable enough to not break over the course of multiple battles were often turned into family heirlooms to be passed down from father to son. Like in Viking mythology, particularly enduring swords were given evocative names and treated as status symbols. The emphasis on inherited weapons didn't mean that the Vikings were adverse to trading up for better quality swords if an opportunity presented itself. The famous Ulfberth steel swords, so named for the nominal inscription found on the weapons, were amongst the greatest blades that the Vikings ever wielded and were sold to the Norsemen by the Franks. Since the Vikings were nothing if not consistent, they showed their gratitude to the Franks by raiding and pillaging along the rivers and coasts of the Frankish Empire, making prodigious use of the very swords that had been given to them. This understandably led to a complete embargo on exporting Ulfberth blades to Scandinavia. The Viking settlers likewise took a similar approach to the North American people's interests in their iron weapons. One leader, Thorfinn Karlsefni, wisely chose never to give away any of his warrior swords or chainmail during the few times when amicable trade was done between the two groups. 
Not everything that the Norse brought over from Europe was as enticing to the American side. However, one incident described the chaos that ensued when a bull used for livestock escaped from the Viking settlement and rampaged through the local area. The native people were so disturbed by the aggressive horned beast from across the sea that it prompted another surprise attack on the settlers. Of course, it's possible that the Beotuk had reason to despise European cattle already, given that they had previously been traded milk from the animals instead of iron weapons and widely did not have the common lactose tolerance of the Vikings. Even the gift of cow milk, given in sincere attempt at diplomacy, might seem more like an attempted poisoning if it came from folks who speak a different language and caused collective stomach distress. Back to the subject of iron weapons. While the usage of native copper in crafting metal objects was widespread across North America at the time the Vikings landed, the Beotuk were seafarers in remote channels that rarely engaged in warfare and had little need for weighty metals in daily life. Their preferred material for weapons and tools was of course stone, with animal bone following in a close second. The utility of these materials for such well-prepared people was obvious. It was far less of a loss for the community if a few arrows or spears sank into the ocean when the resources to make more were much more readily available. According to historical diagrams and recreations, the Beotuk harpoons were 12 to 14 feet long compared to Viking spears, which were 7 to 10 feet long. But in this case, bigger didn't mean better, as Viking spears were intended to be wielded with finesse on the battlefield as opposed to delivering the killing blow to seals and whales. When utilized in tandem with the shield wall tactics that they learned from watching other European peoples, the Vikings could combine offense and defense into one sturdy formation. And of course, as Thorvald found out the hard way, the shield wall is meant to protect from a single direction and loses its effectiveness when fired upon from every direction. A direct full frontal attack with harpoons was far less likely to happen from the Beotuk than continuous archery, which could be sustained for much longer and at a higher rate of fire. But supposing one of these many fights between settler and native did turn into a melee, would it be fair to say that the Vikings would win the day on account of their more durable weapons? This is kind of true, but on an engineering level, does not represent the entire truth. In terms of pound-for-pound -pound efficiency, the Viking iron weapons would doubtlessly outperform the arms of their hated, scrailing foes. But there's also a catch to that assessment. At their most armored, the Vikings settled in the New World would have been wearing iron helmets and chainmail which would work well to stop swords, daggers, and axes, as well as other blades. A stone war club, on the other hand, could inflict serious pain and break bones without needing to penetrate the armor's protective layer. Cloth armor was far more effective at diverting bludgeoning damage, and for this reason it was utilized by many of the same cultures on the American mainland, who would have had clubs as common-use weapons. Whatever armor the Beotuk had was likely similar in design to those cloth armors and thus vulnerable to the slashing power of Viking axes and swords, because it wasn't designed to protect its wear from those sorts of blows. What this comes down to is that in an all-out battle between the strongest warriors on both sides, armor would be rendered less of a factor because of these differences in construction. Of course, cutting into flesh and causing blood loss was the far more immediately deadly method of war, so it stands to reason that the Vikings would have been able to kill more of the Native Americans in any given battle. However, even the mighty Vikings had their limitations, and when bones continued to break and weapons from across the sea became worn down, the number of able men ready to stand against these new enemies would decrease as the months went on, a classic war of attrition. Something to keep in perspective is that the number of Vikings in all the western settlements was only in the hundreds, as opposed to the countless indigenous nations in the surrounding lands. With that small of a population, the fighting force being a fraction of that, a conquest of the region would have been physically impossible. One of the crucial factors behind the Vikings having so much success as raiders in Europe was that their home in Scandinavia was never too far away. Even if the spoils of an individual voyage weren't too impressive, the Vikings could always sail back to a fresh source of food, shelter, and weapons. In the Americas, it was a different story, as the Vikings exploring the unfamiliar land had to juggle maintaining their newly established settlements with conserving as much of the supplies from their home as they could. This was no simple task, especially while having to weather repeated attacks from a much larger military body that knew the land far better than they could ever hope to. Now, granted, the Vikings were quite adept at shipbuilding, as evidenced by their ability to reach the shores of North America in the first place. If a few of their fiercest leaders had come together and decided that enough was enough, it is theoretically possible that they could have mobilized a fleet of longships to sail to the New World and declare war on all the people who lived there. 
From a historical standpoint, this would be extremely out of character for the Vikings, who were pirates and raiders before they were long-term warmongers. But for the sake of this hypothetical, let's imagine that they did bring a full naval force to Newfoundland. The Beotuk would most likely not be able to match such a furious raiding party in direct confrontation and would make a temporary retreat and mass migration to a part of Newfoundland where the Vikings wouldn't seek them out. During the period of later colonization by Europeans, the Beotuk utilized a similar method of avoidance to keep themselves from having to fight an asymmetrical military campaign. They remained hidden for centuries, though this isolation eventually led to their numbers dwindling and even a lack of direct contact with colonists couldn't prevent the spread of European diseases. In the unseen event of a true Viking invasion, the Beotuk may have suffered a similar fate, though it could have just as realistically become a case of mutually assured destruction. The larger the Vikings increased their numbers, the more need there would be to sustain those numbers through subsistence hunting, a prospect that was precarious enough for the original inhabitants of Newfoundland. But it would become even harder for the Vikings, who would be forced to travel further inland for food and supplies. Were this to pass, the Vikings would have had to contend with the Algonquin nations of the northern lands, who were far more accustomed to war than their semi-nomadic Beotuk cousins. And beyond that, the Vikings would be met with one of the most formidable states of pre-Columbian America, the Iroquois Confederacy or the Haudenosaunee. For this powerful collective of five clans, war was not an act of desperation, it was the way of things. In order to confront the reality of death and honor those who were lost to time and circumstance, the Haudenosaunee were eternally engaged in large-scale battles known as mourning wars. The purpose of these wars was not for material possessions or land, but rather to obtain captives from neighboring tribes to replace the community members who died. It was rarely a bloody affair as battles were fought mostly unarmed with wooden armor. The point of the mourning war was always to add to the numbers and release negative emotions associated with the death, not to compound them. For this reason, casualties were avoided unless it was absolutely necessary to take the life of another combatant. Though there were certainly elements of ritual and sport to the Haudenosaunee mourning wars, these endless battles imbued Iroquois warriors with a keen pragmatism and an understanding of battle. French colonists who extensively fought with the Iroquois long after the Viking had departed the Western Hemisphere noted that there was no sense of glory or honor in the Haudenosaunee tactics. If faced with an outside enemy who truly intended to kill them, the Iroquois would fight smarter, not harder. They would begin battles with sneak attacks, engage the enemy only when they were outside of a fortified space, and make tactical retreats if outnumbered. These guerrilla tactics were seen as entirely alien to European methods of war, a practice which at the time was still founded on facing the opponent head-on in mutually decided locations. While frowned upon by the French, British, and British colonists, it was the adoption of such supposedly, quote, cowardly methods of war that initially turned the American Revolution against the British Empire. Against the Vikings, the Haudenosaunee would have likely handled the war the same way, take the enemy by surprise and pick away at them over several strategic encounters. Their numbers would be far greater than the Beotuk, whom the Vikings already had trouble with, and because of their emphasis on preserving every life in the battle, the Haudenosaunee would never perform a reckless charge into a Viking shield wall. It would be a battle of pursuit and attrition, and while the Native Americans had entire regions under their territory, the Vikings would have had to contend with limited numbers, supplies, and morale. While the Vikings certainly had a well-earned reputation for terrorizing Europe, their pillaging could only last so long when they were this far out of their element. In the end, the first conflict between Europe and the Americas wouldn't come down to a contest of metal and metal, but rather a grim acceptance that sometimes you have to admit when it's time to turn the boat around and go home. Now watch why were Vikings so much better at fighting, or check out this video instead.